Okay, guys and gals, thank you for coming to our next uh, Instagram Live Human Hacking um, show here. We're with, we're with Josh Byton. You know, you have been the smoothest guest to, ha to get on. Usually people can't figure it out. Now, so when there has to be a problem. So the problem is you, you, you need a phone, you know, a phone stand. Anyhow, Josh, maybe let's start off by you telling us a little bit about yourself. You have been an actor for um, how many years? Uh, I started professionally acting in 1998. So 22 years, 21 and a half, when I got out of drama school. Um, I grew up in New York. I grew up in Queens um, in a real, like, tough guy neighborhood. You know, uh -huh. people talk like this. Um, uh, it, was, it, was, it was not my favorite place. I have people there I love, but it wasn't my favorite place. It was a little bit tough. It's, um, uh, and then I went to high school in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. I went to college in upstate New York thinking I was going to be a lawyer for the ACLU. That was, <laughs> that's what I wanted to do. And was in an acting class at the behest of like one of my best friends. And in the middle of this acting exercise, I got completely lost and forgot where I was and had this moment with this girl that really changed the course of my life. Where, really? Yeah, the, I forgot where I was. I was completely dropped into this moment. I forgot there was a class in front of us. We were about to kiss. The class started applauding. I woke up. Like, I felt like I'd woken up and I went, oh, I have to do this. The honesty and the contact and the lack of filter was something I don't think I'd ever fully experienced, mm. you know? So, uh, that was kind of what brought me into it. And then I started doing plays and undergrad and things like that. And, and one of my teachers really kindly said to me, you know, you're, you've got talent, you're good at this, you should go get properly trained. Mm -hmm. So I auditioned for uh, the sort of top grad programs in the country. And I was really lucky to get into one with a guy named William Esper, who was my mentor, he passed away a year ago. And um and he really changed the way I saw human contact and behavior. And, mm. uh, and the technique that he taught really resonated with me in that way. Um, and so that's when I started working, you know, started auditioning and working professionally and, um, and eventually led me to also teaching out here in LA, you know. So you made an interesting comment is that um, that your mentor taught you things about communication. Uh, so what is it about communicating or nonverbals that you find is so important when it, you became an actor? Uh, I mean, it's everything, really, um, because what the goal of an actor should be is to not portray something, really, but live in imaginary circumstances in a way that are fully effective on you, which is why. You know, a lot of times when you're lucky enough to get really challenging roles with really high level emotional stakes, they take a toll on you, you know, they wipe you out. Um, it's funny, I was, I was teaching, I teach a dialect class um, and I was teaching a Southern dialect the other day and mm. I asked my students to bring in, after I taught them the sort of fundamentals of it, to bring in a monologue. And one of my students started doing this monologue and I... I had an immediate visceral reaction to it. And about three lines in, I realized that it was a monologue that I had performed on an episode of Justified. And huh. I became, and I did it 12, 10 years ago. And I was immediately emotionally moved just by the wow. words. And so it was sort of almost imprinted in my body like an actual memory or an actual mm. experience. And, and in terms of your question, you know, what Bill uh, taught me was how to really listen and respond and read people's behaviors, not just what they say, mm -hmm. but how they say it. Um, you know, people tend to say more non-verbally than they do verbally, especially yeah. nowadays where I feel like we are so indirect and, and seem to save our direct feelings for social media where mm -hmm. our mirror neurons can't activate and where we're not seeing the effect it has on someone else, we just feel yeah. really good about what it is we post, you know? Yeah. And so what Bill kind of taught me was this very 
honest, very dropped in mode of communication. And mm -hmm. I think I'd been hungry for that my entire life. You know, um, I grew up in a house that had, that was, you know, there's a lot of love, but there was a lot of violence, a lot of yelling, a lot of things being thrown, fists and whatnot. And so I think I always felt like something was off. And when I got lost in that acting moment in that undergraduate class, it was the first time I felt like my emotional temperament didn't just have space to exist, but was oddly lauded. You know, mm. my classmates were like, how did you do that? That was unbelievable. And I didn't know. Mm. And then when I studied with Bill, he started to teach me how I was doing it and how I could do it with consistency and openness, you know? Um, and I guess the last thing I would say to your question is when you're shooting something and you're doing multiple takes or you're in a play and you're doing it night after night, the only way it doesn't get pat and just kind of like, we do this this way, paint by numbers, is by listening and responding off the other person's behavior. And so the, the, the fact that that's something I can do and I was taught to do is really, really has, has, has made the process something that always feels alive and fun and like a wave that I ride rather than a chore, if that makes sense. It does. Um, it's, fa it's actually fascinating. Um, there's a, con there's a question here, which is, uh, do actors, I'm going to, I'm going to reword it a little because I didn't know this first part. Do actors, uh, generally watch shows with the sound off? Um, no, but it's an exercise that was given to me by a teacher and one that I will sometimes give to my students, which is, you know, a lot of, not all techniques, but a, a number of techniques will break acting down into action, not just physical action, but like verb it, verbs. What are you doing? What do you want? How do you get what you want? And if you watch a really great performance with the sound off, without knowing what they're saying, you can figure out what they want and what mm. they're pursuing in their, hum in their behavior. And, and that is where you see the integration of body, spirit, mind, heart, and, and voice, because it's all, it's all coming together, you know, in that way. So it's a great exercise to teach you how to read behavior and also how to see actors really trying to do something, whether trying to get their partner to not leave them or convince their brother to join the military with them or whatever the doing of the scene is, you can figure it out. That's why you can watch a foreign film and yes, the subtitles help, but a lot of times you understand what's going on just by the behavior of the person, mm -hmm. you know? I, yeah. so, so it's a good, it's a good exercise, I would say. For sure. In, in our industry, we do a lot of uh, work with nonverbals also. And I, uh, I, I find that part interesting, viewing it with the sound off, because we always tell people, like, watch a news program or a live interview and look for those nonverbals and see where you see incongruency that can help you determine if someone's giving the true emotion or being honest with what they're saying. Yep. Um, I never thought about trying to use that also to see with the sound off completely. If you can get a sense of what's being talked about. Yeah, that's like a whole new level of, of, of exercise to, to practice nonverbals. I mean, watching I watched some of the debate last night and at some point just went like, this is insane. Yeah, but yeah. It, it was it's really interesting to see from both guys. You know, there are moments where Joe Biden would look away and smile. And my instinct would be, why are you smiling? You're yeah. so angry right now and you're not letting that out. And where Trump would purse his lips and look up and I'd be like, oh, he's fuming. And then, yeah. you know, and then you'd see what maybe he thought, well, it probably was a, a, a controlled response to what was really going on, which was far deeper and far more rageful, you know? Yeah, you know, that's always interesting to me because when you see incongruent, like when you see a facial expression that like you said, like last night, you, you strictly see anger on the face but the macro expression is i'm trying to be happy i always look at that as like a great like can, what can we learn from that and and also I, I look at that for myself because it's easy to fall into that trap you know if you recognize it on yourself to fall into that trap when you're communicating with someone else to show the wrong facial expression at the wrong time can really mislead someone to what you're thinking about about what they're saying 
Yeah, I think that's very true. And also I think what it can do is it can, it can cut into someone's trust of you when yeah. your body language and facial expression is incongruent with what you're saying or what they can vibe or feel from you. And, yeah. and that is, you know, that's why, you know, when I, like when I would watch Biden smile, I was watching with my friend who's been quarantining with me. It made him angry that it wasn't honest in its response. Mm -hmm. And it made him, you know, because of how he aligns himself politically, it wanted, he wanted something more thoroughly raw and honest in that moment. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think it's something that we all learn socially. And it depends on where you're from. Like as a kid in my house and in my neighborhood, anger was currency. Uh -huh. You know, whenever I meet someone who says they have a hard time being angry or raising their voice, I'm thoroughly confused. And when I teach, I see that a lot. But then other forms of human behavior are completely frowned upon. You know, sensitivity, vulnerability, they, you know, they are really, really shunned. And, and to be really honest, I, I was and am a really, I was a sensitive kid. I'm a sensitive man. And I think I found my way into doing this because... I found my sensitivity had a home that was welcome and it, and, and so I could be honest, you know, and then my teacher taught me how to be in a way by teaching me, helping me go deeper into who I was and examining how I actually felt about things. What was my real point of view mm -hmm. of everything, you know? And so, yeah. Do you think of, do you think of uh, the, the best actors are ones who are in tune with their own emotions? hundred percent. I think, I think without question. Um, and my experience has been that, you know, I did this, like one of my favorite projects I ever did um, was this HBO World War II miniseries. It was called The Pacific. And we shot in Australia, which was a thrill. And mm -hmm. I remember at the time I was in a relationship and I was on a phone call with my girlfriend back in the States. And she said, what's it like? What are the guys like? And I said, you know, everybody here is so authentically themselves all mm. the time. And that was such a relief to me. There was no hiding. And so when they worked, they couldn't help but show up on camera because mm. they weren't hiding. They, they can't help but be themselves. And, and there's no like social mask to be like, this is acceptable. This is this, mm -hmm. you know, we were all a bunch of weirdos in our own way. And we were all, you know, tough and sensitive and, and, and funny and playful as, as was our brand of that, you know? And so yeah. because of that, um, I thought the performances in it are all beautiful, you know? Um, and I think, yeah, I think great actors, they know themselves. You know, my teacher used to say, no actor should ever be without class, either class or therapy, because you must <laughs> always be discovering yourself to grow as an artist. And I yeah. think that that's true. Huh. That's, that's fascinating. Uh, that's an interesting, um, <clears throat> an interesting viewpoint. Uh, I didn't think about um, the, the uh, being in touch with your own emotional content, actually helping you portray emotions that may not be real like you're putting on a scene so you're you're, you're building a scene your character yep. and that character may be feeling or experiencing something that you've never felt so how does being in tune with your own emotions help you do that well it helps you personalize it because a lot of times you know i i like to use this as an example like in the movie what's eating gilbert grape john c Riley's character is so excited about the, I think it's called like the rooster barn or something coming to town and he's gonna work at this, ch this fast food chicken place. I could be wrong, but I'm gonna guess that John C. Riley as a man could get about working at a fast food restaurant. But when you watch that movie, like it's funny what he's doing, but he seems like a guy who's truly, truly excited about this. And because he knows what excites him. Do you think that being in touch with your emotions, understanding your emotions can help you even if you're not an actor? I, I, I do. I mean, I, you know, like I was saying before, the thing that drew me to becoming an actor was how pure and honest the contact could be between two people. And I really think, and also the ability to really listen to someone. Mm. 
Um, because I think that this is a, a, a massive issue that we're dealing with yeah. societally. We don't really listen. We don't really engage. You know, I, I finally deleted my Facebook because I realized mm. that there was no real conversation happening. And then I, on Instagram, I started getting somewhat trolled by people who I know when I would post something. And finally, I wrote to them, listen, guys, I love you. That's not going to change. But I won't engage in this conversation unless we're in front of each other. And so because one of the things that I think happens when you're connected to how you feel about things is that you present yourself in a much more honest way to somebody. Remember, I bumped into a friend of mine, Jason, at a coffee shop. And we were, you know, social distanced. We hadn't seen each other. We just happened to go to the same outdoor coffee shop to get a t coffee to go. And I was like, hey, it's great to see you. He was like, wait, 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 wait. I want to talk. And then hmm. talking to each other, it was really tricky. So we stepped further back and pulled our masks down and my shoulders dropped. Um, <laughs> so it is trickier. There are ways to read those behaviors, people's eyes, yeah. body language, tone, you know, um, and, and so I, I can feel a smile when someone's eyes crinkle up or I can tell when someone's tense by the way their body is mm -hmm. moving or not. And also yeah. you can vibe it. You know, you can feel someone's energy if you don't even realize that's what you're doing. So it's harder, but, um, but it is, it's still possible. And so, yeah. um, and also let's be really honest, at least from my understanding of the, all the things I've read, it's necessary right now. If we do yeah. this for a short time, I really believe we'll get through it faster. But, yeah. you know, I do, think it, I do think it triggers a lot of people. I think it triggers a lot of fears, having to wear masks and whatnot. And maybe that's why they're opposed to it, where I'm not, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's important too, because I think we want to categorize people as, as this or that. Mm. And, and we're far grayer than black and white, yeah. you know? Yeah. So... I, think I was just uh, talking to someone the other day and I said, man, you go back eight months. And if I walked into my bank with a face mask, they would have been security would have been on me. They would have been approaching me. And now if I walk into my bank without a face mask, they're asking me to leave. That's so right. you have to. And, and I agree with what you said. You know, it's it's um, you look at countries that instituted uh, face masks being mandatory and you see those countries having a faster decline of covid, less death rate less infection rate. So uh, you're right. I mean, we have to deal with it now. So we have to learn how to communicate despite a situation that may last for longer than any of us want it to last. And yeah. we have to learn how to do that better. Yeah, I, um, I, I worked in Australia. And so some of my closest friends live there. And, you know, I was FaceTiming with a friend of mine who lives in Sydney, and they had um, their first day with zero deaths. And wow. Yeah. And their infection rate was like below 1%. And their, um, and their numbers were like, yeah, we had like 40 cases yesterday. <laughs> and, and, you know, and I'm literally, because I had COVID in early March. And Did you really? Wow. Yeah, yeah. And it wasn't fun. I didn't know that's what it was at first because we didn't have tests. So I first tested positive for the flu and I was told I had the flu. And then one of the people I had gone to Pittsburgh with to see a concert she called us and said, guys, I'm really sorry I hugged you when I saw you, but I have COVID and you need to get tested. So my symptoms were gone. And then I went and got tested and found out, oh, no, I, I, it's still in my system. And then, wow. and then about a month later after that, yeah, no, I'm totally fine. Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> after, about a month after that, I had like a relapse of symptoms. And... Uh, and I got tested again and it was negative. And then a month after that, I had another relapse of different systems and tested negative wow. again. And that seems to be pretty common from what I've, what I've experienced, but it made me hypersensitive to what's happening. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the last three days, I think we've had like 900, 600 and 800 cases. And I've been thrilled that we're below a yeah. thousand. And, and then I speak to my friends in Canada where they had a day a week and a half ago where they had zero deaths in the country yeah. and, in, and in Australia where, you know, everyone talks about this massive outbreak that happened in Melbourne 
And their massive outbreak was 250 cases a day for four days in a row or five days in a row. And then it dropped to 125. We haven't seen 250 cases in a day ever since we've been testing in Los yeah. Angeles. And my family's in New York. I mean, you know, it was a war zone there for a while. So it is painful to see. And I do honestly think that what you guys are talking about is so remarkably important because the reason we, I think, as a country haven't gotten it together is because there's these battle lines that have been drawn and it's one side or the other. We don't communicate. We're not reading each other's behavior. Um, yeah. So I see Maxie's question, how my background shaped this ability to be sensitive. Um, so my, my household was pretty volatile when I was a kid. Um, my father, who I have a great relationship with now, who I love very, very much as a kid was tough. He was explosive. He was rageful. Um, and, and wasn't, I think, happy in the marriage that with my mom, um, probably to no fault of either one of them, but didn't have a really great set of tools on how to handle it. So there was infidelity and stuff like that. And my older brother knew my older brother was old enough for my father to recognize that he knew, which created a war zone. Because my father, when he was younger, his best defense was an offense. So there was a lot of violence, a lot of not great stuff. And so in some ways, you know, the Marines like to say, who I worked with on the Pacific, I'll say poop. Poop rolls downhill, <laughs> right? So it went from my father to my brother, my brother to me. Um, so I caught a lot of beatings and a lot of verbal attack and a lot of verbal abuse. And so I think what happened is at a young age, my heart got cracked open mm -hmm. because I was in pain. And as a kid, you, you don't have language to figure out what that means or how you handle it. Um, there's not a lot of guidance from people on how you work through that. And I think you internalize it a lot. So for me as an adult, um, I can feel there are these wounds as a little kid that really kind of rooted in like, doesn't anyone see what's going on here? Doesn't anyone know that like I'm in pain, my brothers and we're all in pain. Can't someone help? And so I think what that did is it made me sensitive to other people's circumstances. I would, mm. you know, it's one of the things that, I have a hard time saying something like this, but I think it's a strength of mine as a teacher and as an actor is that I can, I can empathetically feel other people's pain, you know? And, yeah. and I think because as a kid, when I, when I saw someone in pain, it was like a kindred spirit. It was a kindred soul. And it made me feel probably less alone. So I, I, I think that that's what started it. And then another thing that helped is my mom, is a pretty remarkable human being. She's just kind and not, and she treats everyone like an equal. I could bring a, when I was 16, I could bring my friend home and she would talk to them like a friend, not like a kid. <laughs> and so I think I was also uh, sort of, it was modeled for me that everybody is worth something, that there's no one who isn't. It's just gonna be, it's no, there's no way to say it, but it'd be a compliment to you. And some people will have had that uh, a life experience and it would not have turned them into a person that can be empathetic. Sure. It, it would may turn them into rage filled or anger filled or, um, or an abuser themselves. I don't want to, I don't want to open up the doors, but I really want to ask this. Is there one thing that you could have identified in your life that allowed you to take that horrible experience and not turn into one of those people, but to turn into someone who uses it for empathy? Wow. Um, that's a really amazing question. Um, I mean, I have a couple of thoughts. The first thing in terms of just to directly answer your question is that I really think my relationship with my mother is what did that is I had empathy for her. I saw the sort of pain she was in and it was just something I didn't want to see. Mm -hmm. I think the thing I want to say is that the rage field filled people, they are empathetic. They are, 
And by that, what I mean is there's a joke amongst my close friends. Like my brother's a tough guy still, <laughs> right? And he always says, you're so effing sensitive. That was for you, <laughs> Maxie. That effing was for you. Um, and, uh, and we all joke that my brother's more sensitive than I am. He responds to things way more volatilely. It's just that the, um, the emotion that he expresses is anger. And there's this mm. kind of scam that's been pulled on humans that anger isn't an emotion or isn't sensitivity. Mm. And it so very much is. And so what I think it, it becomes about is tools of expression. You know, like my brother's mm. in a new relationship and he's super happy. And my friend and I were joking last night because we all had dinner together. And he was like, it's really fun to see your brother soft mm. because He's capable of it. It's part of who he is. But, you know, because what I've learned as a teacher is anger is a gateway emotion. Like they say pot's a gateway drug. It's a cover for pain, hurt, anxiety, fear. And it's a way to sort of push everything away that people are afraid is going to hit or hurt them. And I think maybe for me, one of the things is like seeing my mom in pain as a kid and and also, I don't know if it's a blessing or a curse, but just knowing I was in pain mm -hmm. and that screaming at somebody else never made me feel better was kind of, I think, the thing that set me on a path that sought a career where my empathy uh, had value, mm. you know, because in society and my like tough guy neighborhood where everybody talked like this, mm. being the sensitive kid wasn't exactly a boon, you know what I mean? Yeah. So um, I, 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 I think some of it might just be genetic. I don't know. But I, I also, you know, I think also watching my brother, it was very, very, I, I, I couldn't help but care for him and hurt for him, to be really honest. To, to let that not be part of the way I communicate would be a lie to myself, mm -hmm. you know, and that didn't feel right, I think. What a, what a beautiful answer to, to conclude on. And thank you for that. Despite our technical difficulties, this has been an amazing interview. And um, I have learned a ton myself. Um, I wish we didn't have the breakups in it because there was some great, great uh, conversation happening there. But maybe when Instagram doesn't hate us, we will uh, try this again and have even a more. I got to talk to you for hours. Uh, hey, man, I, I feel the same. I think this was really, really easy. And uh, I love what you guys do. You know, thank you. Um, just so the, you guys know, like these guys help me secure some of those Zoom Al-Anon 12-step meetings by, by teaching us how to do what we do so we could communicate the way we do. I think it's really, really important. And uh, anytime you guys want, I would be back. And though it was tricky and frustrating in moments, I could talk to you forever, man. You're really good at this. So thank, thank you. you so much. Maxie, I love thank you. you. And uh, we'll she's, she's great, isn't she? All joking aside, she's awesome. She's a beast. Look at all those hearts coming up. Someone tell me uh -huh. she's sending them all. <laughs> probably, uh, probably. And they're not for me. Yeah. <laughs> all right, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, real joy. Bye.